I'm just going to give you Susan Jacoby. First of all, thank, thank you all for being here after lunch. Uh, uh, for those of you who will, might begin to doze, I understand. Uh, I'd like to make a request. Please, if you have pictures with cameras with flashes, please do not take pictures of me while I'm speaking. I have a thing which makes it impossible for me to see after somebody flashes something in my face for quite a while. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to begin today by reading you an excerpt of verse printed in the famous abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator, in 1837. This was a reply to a large group of New England Congregationalist ministers who were scandalized by the fact that women were beginning to speak in public on behalf of political causes such as abolitionism. This little poem is titled, The Times That Try Men's Souls. And it was written by an early feminist and abolitionist named Maria Weston Chapman. Uh, goes, they've taken a notion to speak for themselves and are wielding the tongue and the pen. They've mounted the rostrum, the termagant elves, and oh horrid are talking to men. With, with faces unblanched in our presence they come, to harangue us they say in behalf of the dumb. I, now, I'm willing to bet that even in this well-educated audience, some of you never heard the name Maria Weston Chapman before. Not because you're ignorant, but, but because the record of both women's history and secular history, as well as the connections between them, remain woefully incomplete in 21st century America. It's often been said that one of the great weaknesses of the women's movement over the last 200 years or so has been the tendency of its history to disappear so that it has to be resurrected for each new generation. Uh, I did see a perfect example of this in my own life recently when I published this ebook titled The Last Men on Top about my father's generation and what it was like growing up under the values that prevailed in the late 50s and early 60s. As it happens, the birth control pill became available when I was 18 years old, but it was far from clear how or if this pill could be obtained by an unmarried woman, woman, or girls as we called ourselves then, in East Lansing, Michigan. So I went to a gynecologist, <laughs> told him I was getting married in two months, and that I wanted to begin taking the pill so that everything would be just fine for that holy of holies, <laughs> the wedding night. Now, I doubt that the doctor believed this story, but he prescribed the pill anyway. And I'm using this story, by the way, to illustrate the point that not all men of the World War II generation, which this doctor was, were the pigs depicted in Mad Men. Uh, but my 23-year-old niece found it almost incredible that I would have had to tell such a lie to obtain access to the pill. And I've since had many emails from other women her age saying the same thing. Uh, the whole reason we've had this ludicrous recent discussion about whether health insurance should pay for contraception is that our society has really all but forgotten what things were like in the good old days before women fought for the right to control their own reproductive system. My generation of feminists who came of age in the late 60s was operating within the context of a society that knew almost nothing about the long struggle for women's rights that began with the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. If you had asked me in 1968 to come up the name, with the names of American women who'd been active in the struggle for legal justice for their sex in the past, the only one I'm certain I could have pulled out of my head was Susan B. Anthony. I might possibly have thought of Eleanor Roosevelt because I knew she'd been ridiculed as the wife of the president for interest in both the status of women and blacks. But that was pretty much it. The forgetting of the history of marginalized groups is both a cause and effect of their marginalization. If you are marginalized, you don't have the clout to move your story into mainstream institutions like public schools that automatically pass on those stories that are considered foundational to a society. Indeed, one of the main rationales for the existence and public support of such institutions is that they are considered necessary to passing on the common heritage of a culture. Uh, but the pertinent question is just who defines what is common in our so-called common heritage. 
it's not surprising then that the secular movement in America has been characterized by historical discontinuities that in a number of respects resemble the amnesia that held feminism back for so long. Every brand of religion maintains and in fact is a permanent mechanism for transmitting ideas and values. Whether one regards those values as admirable or ridiculous, secularist organizations with their generally loose non-hierarchical structures lack the power to hand down and disseminate their heritage in a systematic way. Even when once marginalized movements succeed in changing their minds in their own generation, as the Enlightenment rationalists did in the American Revolutionary generation, as the abolitionists did in the 19th century, and as feminists did to a considerable degree in the 1970s, they're often subject to remarginalization in the next generation. Reason is not a religion. Secularism is not a religion. Feminism is not a religion. If they were, there'd be a feminist secularist treasury to pay for all of the entertaining and informative speakers who are donating their services at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, one of the inerrant marks of religion, apart from imperviousness to evidence, is that it always has a treasury to pay, if not its foot soldiers, its officers. But I digress. Uh, I'm concerned chiefly with the ways in which the lacunae in women's history intersect with the same phenomenon in secular history. I'm concerned with how this intersection adversely affects our ability to influence public policy. First, I think we've long underestimated the degree to which all movements aimed at justice and social, economic, and legal equality for women have been intertwined with secular movements since the Enlightenment. Now, it's absolutely true that not all Enlightenment thinkers were supporters of women's rights. In fact, most men of the Enlightenment, with the exception of Thomas Paine, don't seem to have given much thought at all to power relations between the sexes. But while not all Enlightenment thinkers were feminists, and I'm just ignoring the fact that feminist was not a term used then, all feminists born at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century were themselves products of the Enlightenment. The Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments, largely written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was born in 1815, is explicitly modeled after the Declaration of Independence stating as it does, the Seneca Falls Declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their duty to throw off such government. Such has been the patient sufferance of women under this government, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they're entitled. Uh, they were referring, of course, to the government of men. Uh, the connection between secular enlightenment values and women's rights was there, by the way, for both secular and religious feminists like the Quaker Lucretia Mott, whom Stanton called the greatest woman of the 19th century after her death in 1881. Where there was a passion for women's rights on the part of religious women of the 19th century, they were invariably pilloried by being called atheists and sluts by the more orthodox of their co-religionists. As for feminists who were agnostics or atheists, like Stanton herself, they were written out of the history of the women's movement for a very long time in the 20th century, in spite of their pivotal importance in the 19th century. After the 1895 publication of Stanton's Women's Bible, which excoriated all religion for its role in the subjugation of women, it was decided by the National Woman Suffragist Organization that the movement for votes for women could not afford to be identified with ungodliness. And even after the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote was ratified in 1920, Stan was largely unknown until the revival of American <laughs> feminism in the early 1970s. There has, by the way, been a similar effort to downplay the importance of secular women in the revived feminist movement of the late 20th century. Now, there are many religious women today who are fighting for equality within their faiths, 
but that was not nearly as true in the 1960s. The fact is that secular women, especially non-observant Jews, played an outsized role in the 1970s women's movement in a way that made feminists themselves uncomfortable, just as they'd been uncomfortable about the anti-religious Stanton in the 1890s. The reasons for this were quite complicated, but it really boiled down to the fact that in socially progressive movements of the 20th century, Jews have always been overrepresented in terms of their numbers in the American population. And the Jewish women who were so prominent among the founding mothers of the 20th century feminist movement, to name just a few, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, and Bella Abzug, were all secular Jews. Now, if you're a Jew, it's difficult to believe in equal rights for women if you believe in a form of Judaism that enjoins men to thank God every day for not having been born a woman. Just as if you're a Catholic woman, it is impossible to believe in a traditional patristic Catholicism that considers the Pope, whom I believe is a man, infallible, <laughs> and says that women can't be priests because none of the 12 apostles were women. That there are many religious women who consider themselves feminists today should not obscure the fact that women's equality was just as much a secular idea essentially a secular idea, as the idea of religious for freedom for all, not just for minority faiths, was a secular idea. To the degree that feminism has become a part of religion today, that's part of the process of accommodation to secular values on the part of liberal religion. In the modern era, that process began with the first geological discoveries in the 18th century, showing that the earth was much bolder than the older than the biblical time frame. It intensified in the 19th century with Darwin's theory of evolution, and has continued, at least in America, to this day. The question of how much accommodation to make for secular values is not only a divisive force between religions, but within all, every religion, as we witness in the confrontation between the Vatican and those uppity American Catholic <laughs> nuns. Feminism, because of the essentially misogynist nature of all sacred books of monotheistic religions, is by its very nature a secular challenge to faith. The reason it's been so difficult for American feminism to own up to and own its secular of of origins is, of course, a product of the idea that there can be no morality without religion. The secular movement, for its part, has until re re fairly recently found it difficult to own up to the importance of feminist actions on women's issues as a template for general secular action within society. It's one reason I'm so glad to see so many women here today, men here today. It's a real contrast from last year where the audience was 95% female, and I see that that is no longer true and am very heartened by it. Uh, we've begun to see much more emphasis. And, and by the way, I ought to particularly say that Melody Hensley's work with Washington chapter of CFI has a lot to do with this. She's, she's, she's worked really hard at this and not always initially with the thankfulness that she might have deserved. Uh, okay. Uh, the question is why it's taken so long for this to happen. And I think the answer is, again, to be found in all of the discontinuities in both secular and women's history. There's been no prominent atheist, no prominent figure in the secular movement for the past 40 years who's made women's rights a fundamental rather than a side issue in the battle for secular values. Christopher Hitchens, Richard, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris, without question, the three best-known atheist writers of the past decade, have written about women's rights as a secular issue largely as it concerns the treatment of women within the radical precincts of Islam. Now, I should make it clear that I think telling the truth about what Islamic theocrats do to women is extremely important, and I'm totally opposed to multiculturalists who try to justify religious violence and discrimination against women, whether in areas controlled by the Taliban or in certain Muslim immigrant communities around the world. But we need as secularists to understand that discrimination and violence against women are hardly confined to the Islamic world, that they are hardly things of the past, and that they do 
have religious origins. I mean, note, uh, <laughs> note, note, we haven't seen any instances of women locking up men in houses for 10 years for, in, in our recent uh, criminal history. Uh, now, one of the reasons Robert Ingersoll has been long been one of my heroes is that he is the only famous male American freethinker in our history to really make a priority out of women's rights as a secular issue. His rejection of the idea that women were by nature intellectually inferior, which was an article of faith for most women as well as men in his era, was one of his distinguishing figures as a humanistic freethinker. Uh, Ingersoll's 20th century biographers failed to recognize, probably because most of them were writing before the emergence of the second wave of American feminism in the 1970s, that he held a radical view of women's rights and wrongs that went far beyond the suffragist movement of his day. In the battle over the subjugation of women, he sided with Stanton, who viewed religion and centuries of religion-based law rather uh, as the main cause of women's oppression, rather than with those who saw the vote itself as the ultimate remedy for all of women's ills. Like Stanton, Ingersoll viewed the franchise as necessary but not sufficient for women who wish not only to be the helpmates of men, but the mistresses of their own lives. In this, Ingersoll resembled the feminists of the 1970s and 80s rather than the suffragists of his own time. Before there were any reliable means of contraception, Ingersoll spoke about birth control as the precondition for women's liberation from servitude. He also understood that compulsory, compulsory childbearing was used by both the church and by individual men to stymie any other aspirations women might possess. And I think this is particularly important in view of the efforts of the religious right today to limit access not only to abortion, but to contraception. Ingersoll said emphatically, you know, it's 1888 people, science must make woman the owner, the mistress of herself, must put in the power of woman to decide for herself whether she will or will not become a mother. Women would never be truly free as long as they were forced to rely, Ingersoll said, on the self-control of men to avoid unwanted pregnancy. Uh, uh, this is the solution of the whole question, he emphasized. This frees women. Then the babes that are born will be welcome. They will be clasped with glad hands to happy breasts. They will fill homes with light and joy. By the way, he got really criticized for using the word breasts in a speech, too. <laughs> Uh, those who considered the very mention of birth control obscene were horrified by the possibility that women might choose whether or not to have children because it's involuntary motherhood that did and does guarantee patriarchal control over all female behavior. Ingersoll went on to describe the ethos of both men and women, quote, and this is great, who believe that slaves are purer, truer than the free, who believe that fear is a safer guide than knowledge, that only those, that those who are really good are only those who obey the commands of others, and ignorance is the soil in which the perfumed, perfect flower of virtue grows. It's instructive to think about this quotation when thinking about what the inimitable Rush Limbaugh had to say about Sandra Fluke, whom he called a slut who wanted the government for pay to, her, for, to pay for her to have sex. Ingersoll had something to say about that, too. He noted that many husbands regarded religion as the real guardian of their wives' fidelity and their daughters' chastity. Quote, these men think of priests as dis detectives in disguise, he said, and regard God as the policeman who prevents elopements. <laughs> love it. You've got to love the man, even though he's been dead since 1899. Now, he was well aware that women as a group were more religious than men. But in sharp contrast to the Victorian moralists who considered the female sex purer than the male, he attributed feminine religiosity not to women's higher nature, 
but to her lack of education and utter economic dependency on her husband. In his preface to the prominent freethinker Helen H. Gardner's Men, Women, and Gods in 1885, Ingersoll said flatly, woman is not the intellectual inferior of man. She has lacked not mind but opportunity. There were universities for men before the alphabet was taught to women. At the intellectual feast, there was no place for wives and mothers. Even now, they sit at the second table and eat the crust and the crumbs. Schools for women at the present time are just far enough behind those for men to fall heirs to the discarded. On the same principle that when a doctrine becomes too absurd for the pulpit, it is given to the Sunday school. And there, by the way, is your connection between feminism and secularism. Now, By placing so much emphasis on Ingersoll, I'm not suggesting that what secular women need today is a man to speak for them. Far from it. Where would I be? Uh, but, but, but what the secular movement needs is more people, both men and women, who have a real passion for the importance of what were once considered exclusively women's issues to the secular movement as a whole. Just issuing press releases against abortion, contraception, and violence against women is not enough. After the terrible nor'easter storm, Sandy, the American Atheist chapter in New York City, pitched in with volunteer work in the effective community, affected communities and was recognized for it. I think we all need to be involved in a similar way when volunteers are needed for causes of special import to women. And for that matter, for that matter, for all social causes that are closely connected to secular values, even if that is not immediately obvious. But women's causes, I would say, are particularly important to us in a strategic sense because of demographics. We need more active women in the secular movement. I do think that there are many more women atheists than we see reflected in the polls, simply because atheism is a social pejorative is something to which I think women are more sensitive than men. For example, I received an email for a woman, from a woman in Texas when I wrote a column for the New York Times after Newtown in which I criticized atheists who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. The column was reprinted the following week in the Dallas Morning News. And my author website was flooded with impassioned communications from atheists in Texas. Now, this one from a woman who lived in a suburb of Zal uh, Dallas uh, really you know, brought me up short, uh, told me something I sh should have thought of but didn't. She's an atheist who does describe herself as spiritual but not religious, not because she's afraid of being criticized herself, but because she knows it would affect the way her children are treated. This was very instructive for me because I hadn't thought about it. I have no doubt that such things do weigh much more heavily on women than on men. At the same time, I don't think we're going to get anywhere if mothers are afraid of standing up for their beliefs and showing their children that atheism and secularism have a proud tradition among women as well as men. That is why it's so crucial for us all to reclaim this knowledge at the intersection of feminism and secularism that has been too often lost in each generation. I was recently reminded that this year marks the 65th anniversary of what's arguably the most important 20th century Supreme Court decision on church-state relations. It's the one from which all others descend. McCollum versus the Board of Education of Champaign, Illinois. The case was brought by Vashti McCollum, who died at the age of 93 in 2006, challenging the practice of allowing clergy to provide religious instruction for students in and on the premises of public schools in Illinois. Classes for Protestants were held in the schools. Jews and Catholics had to go to their own churches. Records were kept and students who did not attend any religious instruction had to go to a special classroom and be singled out from the rest. The key issue in this case, which is continually raised today, is whether the First Amendment ban on religious establishments meant that all faiths must be treated equally or whether it required public neutrality between belief and unbelief. The latter was Vashti McCollum's contention and she won an eight to one decision with the majority opinion written in 1948 by Hugo Black. In his opinion, 
he wrote that the use of tax-supported schools to aid religious groups to spread their faith falls squarely under the ban of the First Amendment. Uh, and by the way, I was reminded of this by Vashti McCollum's son, David, who is still alive and who doesn't in any way resent his mother for having communicated her atheism to him. During the three-year struggle in which it took for the case to make its way to the Supreme Court, Mrs. McCollum was fired from her job as a dance instructor at the University of Illinois. The family's cat was lynched. So it is not difficult for me to sympathize with that mother in Texas who felt that her children would be ostracized if it became common knowledge that they were being raised by atheists. Given the nature of this audience, I imagine that most of you do know who Vashti McCollum was and how important her case was. But I assure you that the rest of America doesn't know, that it's not in any of the school textbooks that people like the Texas Board of Education think have been so infected by secularism. The case is not in high school history books. In that respect, the history of church-state separation is taught rather like evolution, in that it tends to be mentioned obliquely and talked about as if the issue were only one of freedom of religion than also of freedom from religion. Vashti McCollum, who wrote about this case in her book, One Woman's Fight, is yet another woman and mother in the pantheon of forgotten secular heroes. It is up to us what I would like to see for everyone to take away from this conference. It is our job to restore the full history of women's involvement in the secular movement to our own store of knowledge as secularists and atheists. Only then can we begin to fight effectively to restore secular history to American history as a whole, which has not happened. Thank you.